How many got their Bibles this morning? Amen. Praise the Lord. And, uh, glory be to God. It's a great day to preach the Word, isn't it? Amen. It's a great day to study the Word. It's a great day. I guess any day is really. Praise the Lord. I was mulling over the Word this week and going over different things. What I had uh, preached on our last session was um, creating an atmosphere for faith is what the, the title of my message was. And God hit me with this thing about atmosphere. A lot of times we do things, we go along with what's going on and, and we look at how bad things are, but looking at the world. And by doing that, the devil uses that kind of to get our focus and our attention off of what God wants to do, what he, what he uh, possibly can do, if we'll believe him and trust him in it. And that's where I kind of left over. I didn't, I still had that ringing from last, from our last session and then God showed me something uh, this week. And uh, I didn't have room for the title I wanted to use because it would be this long. <laughs> so I'll just tell, tell you, it's called Impacting the Size of Your Problems. I shortened it down. But what it really, uh, it, the, the title of my message should be this. It should impacting the size of the problems by uh, impacting the problems by the size of our God. But it was too long to fit on the page. <laughs> so I shortened it up. To, that's what it means. Anyway. Impacting the size of our problems. And I, I don't have to go around the room and say, does anybody here have any problems? <laughs> for all you that don't have any problems, you can go on home. I mean, I got nothing for you, so praise the Lord. But if you have problems this morning, you might want to listen to this message. Praise the Lord. I see everybody stand. Good. Praise the Lord. It was, it was risky, wasn't it? Amen. <laughs> um, I, I, how many, I shared this before, but a couple of heroes in the Bible I want to get to this morning, a couple of my heroes. One of them in the New Testament uh, aside from Jesus, I mean, who, nobody compares to him. But the fact is, is, is I look at the disciples and their walk with the Lord and how they taught and, and different things they went. I'm inspired by all of them. But one stands out to me, and that's the, that's the Apostle Paul. Probably because he's the least, uh, he, if, if he was in his high school, he'd be the least likely to be an apostle of Jesus <laughs> or a follower of Christ. The least likely. He was a persecutor of the church, amen, when Paul was Saul, the, uh, praise the Lord, but uh, he, was, he was persecuting. Matter of fact, when they took Stephen out and stoned him because for preaching the gospel, preaching Jesus is what he was doing, um, they hand a man, in a stoning, they hand a man his coat. They took Stephen's coat off and they handed it to a person. That person they hand it to and holds the coat is the accuser that's in, in the custom. So praise the Lord. So what they did, what they took out Stephen and he stoned him. And he said Stephen was standing there before he died. He looked up to heaven. He says, I see the Son of God standing at the right hand of the throne. Follow me now. Jesus doesn't stand at the throne. He sits unless he's about to move. Amen. The posture from sitting to standing meant something. Jesus sat at the right hand of the Father. Remember, he said, when I go to heaven, he says, if I do not go, the comfort will not come. So he has ascended, and he sat at the right hand of the Father. The right hand in Jewish custom, and everybody knows this, is a, is a side of strength and power. Amen. Amen. So Jesus sat. In that sitting position, he is fixed in that position of power and strength. Amen. When he stood up, now he's ready to move forward. Amen. There are, three, there are three postures in the Christian faith uh, that Paul spells out in Ephesians. Sit, amen, walk, and stand. I'm going to get to that in a minute, but I want to get ahead of myself. So the man who was holding the coat of Stephen was Saul or Paul. And it's almost like when Jesus stood up, he looked for the coat and says, you're marked. Paul goes on, he does his stuff, he's still persecuting the church on his way back to the road, um, the road to Damascus. He's actually on the back to Jerusalem. If you've ever seen the old city of Jerusalem, each gate has a name. Uh, of the gate, uh, uh, Damascus gate actually was a road back in ancient times that you took to go to Damascus. And that's what, so the name. So Paul was on his way back to Jerusalem is when he runs into Jesus. Remember he was run off, he was knocked off his horse, he was blinded. Uh, from the glory, and, and God says, "Why do you?" Per Jesus said to him, "He says, why do you persecute me?" Amen. Amen. So, so Jesus takes the persecution of um, 
of Stephen or anybody, or us for that matter, takes it very personal. I don't know if you realize that, but the persecution of, of his believers, he takes very personal. But when God marked him, it was like, okay, now the thing that you're doing to persecute, that you think you're helping out the synagogue, he says, I'm going to turn it around. And Paul actually was the one apostle that wrote two-thirds of the New Testament of the Bible. He wrote 14 books. I believe he wrote Hebrews, so that's, I, I include that as 14. Some theologians will tell you 13. No, I, I, I read the book of Hebrews. It is a, it's right down the, the line of what Paul saw. So I say 14. Seven of those books he wrote while he was in prison, while he was captive. Isn't it amazing how the world turned on him? He, the Roman government was all for him before because he was... He was uh, uh, stoning Christians and, 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 and keeping them from miracles is what he was really keeping them from doing because the, 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 the religion had a tough time explaining the miracles that Peter, James, and John were doing in Jerusalem. And those three men had the entire town turned upside down. Amen. So Paul was, when he was called Saul, of course, don't be mixed up by the names, okay? Matthew, in the book, of Matthew, name was also Levi. Okay, there's a lot, so it was common to have two names. One was their Jewish name, uh, and the other one was uh, more of a Gentile name. So Saul became Paul in ministry, but he's the same person. Amen? Yeah. And he goes on from there, but God does something magnificent with this man, but he, isn't it amazing that he had to overcome the same kind of persecution that he was given out. Matter of fact, one time they had to lower him over a basket, get him out of the city because the, they, the, the religious leaders spoke of killing him. Amen? Make no mistake about it, religion to this day is not a friend of God. It's not a lesser Christianity. Religion in its, in its rawest form becomes an enemy of God. It was the religious leaders that condemned Christ to death. It might have been Romans that pounded the nails in his hand, but the fact is it was religion that condemned him, and it was religion that got the people to condemn him also. However, when Paul had this personal encounter with Christ, it was, it was different than what he was taught by the religious leaders, wasn't it? And, and, and Jesus was this uh, person who was claiming to be the Son of God. He really was, and he saw his glory. Not only that, he had to depend upon one of the people who he would have persecuted or stoned in a minute to come and lay hands on him to pray so that he could get his sight back. Isn't it amazing? Until, until that encounter happened again with the body of Christ, so the encounter was first with Christ, then an encounter with a representative of the body of Christ here on earth had to lay hands on him. He couldn't do a thing of what God had called him to do until that, those two encounters took place. So though we have an encounter with Christ, there's still an important encounter that we have with each other. Amen? Yes. Amen? For a vision or for whatever you want. Or you want. I, want to, I want to talk in both realms this morning. Anyway, let me get to the one point. Uh, Paul said this in, 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 uh, in 1 Corinthians. How many know that the church of Corinth was Paul's challenge? Ephesus was beautiful. Uh, the, you read the book of Ephesians. They had a revival there that was compared to none. I mean... It is the only epistle in the entire Bible that Paul never wrote a rebuke for. <laughs> However, if you want to count rebukes, that you have the whole first letter of Cor to Corinth was nothing but one great big rebuke. <laughs> if you look at the thing, he had his hands full. They were carnal Christians. They were doing everything wrong. Isn't it amazing? Because of Paul coming from a religious background, religion, the first thing they want to do is stop this nonsense. So you're, you're, you're getting drunk in a communion wine, you're, 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 you're prophesying wrong, you're talking out of turn, it's a massive confusion, God is not the author of confusion, all this stuff going on, you're not doing anything right, it's all wrong. You think right there, Paul says, okay, I'm shutting you down, that's it. I'm shutting you down until you read your Bible, get some smarts, and come back. <laughs> Amen? Paul didn't do that, did he? He says, let me show you a more excellent way. In other words, you're getting it all messed up. It seemed like Paul was drawn to the misfits <laughs> that religion wouldn't look at twice. 
<laughs> I know, I've, I've heard this myself, praise the Lord. <laughs> but drawn to the misfits. Let me show you a more excellent way. Because there was something in the, in the church of Corinth that Paul said was valuable. And if you read the first letter to the church of Corinth and the second letter, you wouldn't believe it was the same church. You wouldn't believe it was the same group of people. Amen. Amen. So all they needed was some guidance and some direction, but the heart to serve God was in there. I'll take that any day. I'll take a whole bunch of people that are doing everything wrong that are correctable than I would a bunch of religious knuckleheads that think they know it all. Did I say knuckleheads? That's an old expression. It's, it's, anyway, praise the Lord. Uh, uh, I, I'm full of them. I got all kinds of old expressions. Amen? All right, yeah, thank you, Jesus. You don't want to hear him. Anyway, praise the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 3, he says, Paul says this in one of his rebukes. He's watching what's going on in Corinth, and he says, for you are still carnal. <laughs> so this is his, his conclusion. He's looking at what they're doing. He says, that you're still carnal. He said, that's it. You're, you're, there's nothing spiritual about you. You're still carnal. He said, listen to me. He said, here's where, where you're missing it. He said, for where there is envy, strife, and divisions among you, you are, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? So it must be that Paul had the right to bring the scripture and to bring the guides of the Holy Spirit. Say, if you're, if you're acting like mere men, this is not correct. Well, that's what we are, mere men. How can we not act like mere men when that's what we're arm is mere men? Because he said, let me reveal to you a higher calling than just what you think. Here's a uh, thing that cracks me up sometimes is we're trying to wrap God. We're trying to get an understanding of God through our understanding. God is never looking for us to understand him. For one thing, you cannot understand him. Amen? Because just when you have God figured out, you don't. <laughs> I was... It was 1990, I think in that year, I, I, I spoke on this subject about three different times in my message. We just started the church here in Key West. I had two, two things that I was supposed to do according to I was getting from God. Go into intercessory prayer, not only for, for, the, uh, uh, for our people, but for intercessory prayer for the condition of the city. Another thing I was supposed to do is enter into spiritual warfare. I interpreted that in a couple different ways. And, um, and it was just, it was, well, yesterday I picked it up, and then this morning God put a, showed me this thing in, in where I was, what I was teaching back in 1990. And this is going to sound funny, but this morning I just got it. <laughs> now you tell me God don't have a sense of humor. But his mercy and grace has been on me all that time, even though I did not understand well, all of a sudden, in this particular message that I was, I was preparing for, he gave me the understanding of what I had back in 1990. Now, it wasn't the same message, but it was an understanding of that and different things. And, and, and what happens is, in 1990, when God says, go into intercessory prayer, I want to pray for everybody. I want to pray for everything that I think is wrong. So it can be right. Have you ever lived in a city like that? It doesn't exist. <laughs> For that matter, a church like that doesn't exist. Amen? Amen. <laughs> and when it thinks it does, it needs to humble itself and go back to God and find out the truth. Amen? But it, anyway, so, so I was doing what I was doing, and then God began to show me. He says, what you were doing was correct. What you were doing is biblical, but your posturing was wrong. And then it began to dawn on me. How many think about our posturing where God is? We're so enwrapped in what we're doing that we forget our positioning in heavenly places. I'm, gonna, I'm getting ahead of myself, but I want to sh share some things with you. Paul looks at the church of Corinth, and I believe this to be true. Paul looked at Corinth and says, you know what? They could be better than this. If I can be better, they can be better. Better how? They had everything that they were doing. They had the communion elements. They had all the stuff that they were doing. They were going to church and they were showing up and they were doing these things. <laughs> Probably better than some, day, some today. But the fact is, they were doing, but they weren't becoming. 
In other words, they didn't have the connection with the Heavenly Father, but they wanted to do everything. I've seen, how many have seen people like this? They want all the benefits of the kingdom, but they don't want to quite pay the price. I want all the benefits of the kingdom, but I want it easy. <laughs> I, want all, I, I want the health, I want the prosperity, I want all the things of the kingdom, but man, don't make me go to church. Are you here? Are you here? Yeah. Oh, praise the Lord. You haven't been more concerned here for a minute. Praise <laughs> the Lord. So he says, he's you're not still calm. Now, he, mentions, he mentioned three things here. Envy, strife, and divisions. What does that mean? Envy, wrong in thought, inward grudges, disaffections towards each other. The second thing is strife, wrong in word. Strife or contention refers to their, to their words. And then the second thing was divisions. That's wrong in deed. So they're wrong in thought, wrong in word, and wrong in deed. The deeds refer to their conduct as they could not agree. They contended until they separated from each other. And it caused a division. This is what Paul went in, and this is what he saw, and this is where he took it from there. Now what he says in the next verse is interesting. Oh, I'm sorry, jump down th uh, three verses, down to verse 6. Same, ch same chapter, 1 Corinthians, verse 6. And Paul says this, he makes this statement, he says, I planted, Apollos watered. Now, Apollos was a Jew, he was a teacher that went around from place to place, traveled just like Paul did. But he says there was two functions that happened here. He says, I plant, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. If that doesn't speak of co-laboring, I don't know. Hang on there. I've got another one for you for co-laboring with God. In other words, as soon as Paul realized that, listen, I'm here, plant seed. If we go back to Mark chapter 4, Jesus talked about the sower and the seed. Some falls on different, different kind of ground, correct? Yes. Okay, but you don't water seed that's not been planted yet. Amen. Are you here? So there's two different functions going on at the same time. Paul is saying, I'm coming in, I'm going to plant the word. This is, I'm going to give you the truth, I'm going to give you the revelation of God, this is what we know. Now what happens is Paul leaves. Well, they remember it for a while, and then they forget again. Then Apollos comes along. He said, no, 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 remember that seed that Paul raised? See, both of them are working in conjunction, not against each other. Amen. They're not looking for their own reputation and who wrote the most books and who, who's a better preacher. They're not doing that. In other words, the, 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 the planting and the watering work in conjunction, but it's all for that seed that give that seed a chance to sprout in a root. Yes, sir. We're trying to water people that have never been planted. <laughs> I don't care what you do. You can go in my yard, you can pour water out on the ground. Doesn't mean anything's going to grow. I mean, even when you plant something and water it, sometimes it might grow, may not grow. I got a mango tree in my backyard that I bought from Home Depot when it was this high. This mango tree now is about 12 to 15 foot high. Never have I ever gotten one mango off that stupid tree. Not one. I go over to Matthews and steal his. No, I don't. <laughs> I, don't. I thought about it, but I didn't do it. Because <laughs> they got like three. We got like three mango trees. Two. Two that look like three. Four. And it produces mangoes like crazy. They got mangoes coming out their ears. This is unfair, God. I'm preaching the gospel. I'll preach right here. <laughs> he said, well, don't buy your trees at Home Depot. All right. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I got a tree that was neutered or something. I don't know. And I got bees. I got beehives of pollinate, so there's no excuse. It don't even get a flower out there so the bees can attack it. Praise the Lord. Anyway. All right, I feel better now. I hope we go on preaching. <laughs> Paul said, I planted a pile of water, but God gives the increase. If somebody doesn't plant and somebody doesn't water, where's the increase? Maybe the lack and deficiency we have is a lack and deficiency not in what God wants to do, but in what we allow him to do. If we will take the seed and if it falls on hard ground or wrong ground, it's not going to take root anyway. Well, can't God just come in and force it down? Sure, he can. He can do it. He's got to do whatever he wants. 
but he's chosen not to. He's chosen to co-labor with us. I'm not done yet. Praise the Lord. This is good. Amen. Listen to what he, what he says. Verse 7. So then neither he who plants is anything or he who waters is anything, but God who gives the increase. Why? He's saying, okay, you can plant and you can water, but the whole idea of planting and water, we see increase. So how many know God, when he intervenes, he's looking for increase in your life? Not only is he looking for it, but he's taking what has been planted and taking what has been watered, and he's causing you to have increase. Yes. I thought that was good. I, man, I, just, I just shout hallelujah right there. Praise the Lord. Amen. God gives the increase. Verse 8, he says, Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. So we, the person does get reward for the labor. For we are, listen to this, we are God's fellow workers. I put in parentheses in my notes, co-laborers. Yes. Paul is demonstrating that when we work in conjunction with what, what God wants to bring forth, now we become co-laborers. When we're looking to do our own thing, whenever we feel like it, we're not co-laborers. We're expecting God to co-labor with our plan instead of the other way around. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. This co-laboring thing and this thing we want to talk about this morning, because what happens is your problems that you're facing this morning, whether they're big or small or just irritating, I don't care what, what the problem is. If you're facing a problem this morning, okay, I'll guarantee you that problem probably has your attention. And I, I won't guarantee it, but I, I kind of know from my own experience that sometimes the problem has more attention than it deserves. And it's attention that I should be given to what God has said for the answer for that problem instead of looking at the problem. Amen. How many preachers have preached over the years in my life that I know going back years have preached about look at what's happening in the world out there to describe the end times? Okay. So in other words, what's out going on out there that describes the end times is what the devil's doing. So as a church, let's look at what the devil's doing so we can find out what God wants to do. Is there something wrong with that? There's a whole lot wrong with that. Yes. Amen. For one thing, we need to mind our own business. <laughs> First Thessalonians 4.11. <laughs> this church should know that verse over any other verse. Mind your own business. Anyway, praise the Lord. But no, the thing is, is this is what we're looking at. God is saying, no, focus on what I'm doing. Yes. Because these storms and stuff around us have nothing to do with going to the other side. Yes. Jesus proved that twice. Amen. One time he was sleeping in the back of the boat. Peace be still. The storm had to shut up for him. I guess God didn't send, I guess the, God the Father didn't send the storm because if God the Father sent the storm, he just went against God the Father. He wouldn't do that. Then he came walking on the water. He just, he just defied all principles and walks on the water. And Peter said, that be you. Let me walk on the water too. He's stupid. <laughs> but he did. <laughs> and he did. Because of the word that Jesus put forth said, come. When God gives you an opening and permission, stop looking at the storms because that's the thing that's going to sink you. That's the problem. What happens is the problem will become bigger than our God is supposed to solve it. But when we can focus on the word come, I don't care what the problem is doing. It can be all kinds of problems. I'm going to focus on what God said to do. Yes, sir. Amen. Whenever you can usually tell when you step out and do something in faith that God has prodded you to do, because you'll have lots of critics. And you'll have lots of people, even people in your own profession, that will tell you what you're doing is not going to work. Like, whose side are you on? <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. 34 years running in Key West, this has been one of those things for me. And even if he had colleagues say, why are you wasting your time in this town? Wasting my time. So all of a sudden now doing what God has called me to do is a waste of time. I think it's the other way around. I think when you do your own aspirations, it's a waste of time. Yes, sir. Thinking you're going to add one thing to your life. Amen? Amen. 
Praise the Lord. No, I don't feel it's a waste of time. Amen. I feel we have an opportunity. We have an opportunity to change the atmosphere in this town. Yes. Praise the Lord. And you want to see it back in 1990 compared to what it is today. So it's changing. Oh, slow, of course. But I'm not looking to get the whole town saved. Oh, well, wait a minute. But why not? I said, I'm not looking to get the whole town saved. I'm looking at what God wants me to do here. Yes. Amen. And if I can fulfill what I do here, people's lives will be changed everywhere. Amen. Amen. Yes, sir. And he had, to, he had to stick me on an airplane to show me that. But anyway, praise the Lord. For we are fellow workers. I love that. We are fellow workers, God's fellow workers. And you are God's field and you are God's building. Amen. What does God do in a building? He brings his presence to where the priest couldn't even stand. Amen. It was overwhelming presence. Amen. Amen. If you're God's field, then guess what? He just harvested you Amen. because we're in a time of harvest. So we look at that for the unbeliever, you know, the, the other people out there, the heathens, whatever. <laughs> well, I think we start, start looking at some of the things inside. And another hero in the Bible, one of my favorites, um, matter of fact, I think he's the very first sermon I ever preached, ever, uh, was, was David and Goliath. Who doesn't like, I mean, come on, that story's got everything. It's got the underdog winning against the overdog and the, you know, the whole thing. But what David said in 1 Samuel chapter 17 really strikes my interest. He said in verse 26, Then David spoke unto the men that stood, with, stood by him, saying, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach of Israel? For who's, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Let me back up the story. You all know David was just a shepherd boy. Until Samuel come over one day, he uncorked his horn of oil and poured it over and said, this is the next king of Israel. Amen? So he carried that with him. Did David all of a sudden move to Jerusalem and step on the throne, push Saul all the way, say, okay, I'm, I'm in now, the prophet says so. No, because David knew, just like the prophet knew, this was a, this was a time and season type of thing. Prophet is, is for speaking. Amen? We ask for the wisdom from God, which is, is what we're supposed to do. Matter of fact, he asks us to give wisdom. And it's like this, like I shared with you before. If you look at that wall, your natural eye, your understanding can see the drywall, can see the paint of that wall, can see everything about that wall, the flags hanging on it. But wisdom can see the studs behind the wall. What God is trying to do a lot of times is get our attention to look to the studs behind the wall, not just the wall. Because the studs are important, otherwise it wouldn't be no wall. <laughs> well, anybody knows anything about construction at least not for very long I mean you could try to stack that drywall up on the edge like that but it ain't going to last praise the Lord amen. amen so what happens you can't see the studs but wisdom can see the studs amen. so God amen. says ask of me and I'll give it to you liberally sure. who's this uncircumcised Philistine that talks about covenant but where did David get the gumption to come in and tell the men? Here's the problem. He pointed out the problem. He says, what would a man get if he killed this uncircumcised Philistine? Do you know that was the furthest thing from everybody's mind at the time? There was nobody, they, they didn't even want, Saul was the biggest guy there. He didn't even want to go out and meet this guy. So he's in his tent shivering in, 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 in across the valley. I've been to the Valley of Allah. It's kind of neat. But the fact is, there he is, and this big old giant come out who's been trained in warfare. He's a fighting machine since he was youth. And he's saying, here's what we'll do. Now, first of all, this isn't how God does warfare. I would have used the word against him. God doesn't put two champions together and we'll just serve the winner. Or we'll just be slaves to the winner. Or the loser will be slaves to the winner. I mean, that's not God's plan. That's man's plan. So here the Philistine is dictating, listen to me carefully in this one, the Philistine is dictating to the covenant people of what they should do. Yes, sir. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> the Philistine, big old Philistine, because they were so impressed with his size, they forgot about the size of their God. Yes. 
So the people who are, have a covenant with God, okay, are standing there and they're impressed by the size of the enemy and they become more impressed with the size of the enemy. They were even considering what was going to happen if we lose to this guy and everybody's afraid to engage him. If they had a sense of covenant, the whole army was, a, okay, send them out here and then take the whole army and attack all of them. Amen. That's how we fight. Since when do we take orders from the devil on how we're supposed to gain spiritually and how we're supposed to take ground spiritually? Since when do we listen to the devil and how his plan and maneuvering is to win problems of this world which he controls? Amen? We don't. Matter of fact, God is who God is. He's the one that created all this and we serve him. And to another, we do not bow. So every time I get a little twinge or an idea uh, that doesn't sound like him, nah, I'll cast that thing down <laughs> and go back to what God has said. See, it doesn't matter. The man who plants or the man who waters doesn't matter. What matters is God has put an increase in the people that need increase. And you are an instrument to be used of that to be with increase. Then God rewards you according to your faithfulness in doing that, bringing increase to people. So my job this morning is to bring increase to your life. It's not to tell you what you're doing wrong. Amen? It's not to tell you that, you, 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 you know, you, boy, you are, you're a mess. Isn't it amazing? I had two children, and, and we taught them both how to walk. And my son, when he first started walking, you know, he, he started walking. He was clumsy as all get out. I thought he had two left feet. Anyway, he'd call, and he'd fall, and he we, we we're actually, we lived in a... a um, a mobile home, we first got married when Eric was first born. We were moving furniture out. We had to get rid of the furniture because it kept falling against it. So we moved the furniture out. But no, never once did my wife say, man, you stupid little kid, what's the matter with you? Can't you walk? Nobody ever does that to their children. That's exactly what religion does. When a person falls, there is no compassion, there is no mercy on it. Are you here? Come on, you can do better than that. Oh, come on, yeah, you fell. Come on, get back up again. Let's, let's hit it again. We're not going to let the devil win this one. Amen. Come on, Eric, come on, Eric. And I would sit there, come on, Eric, come on. And he'd take a couple steps like this, and I kept moving back. He keep raising the bar. Come on, Eric, come on. You can, oh, you can do it. Come on, you're my son, you can do it. Eventually he walked. Then Stacy came along, we did the same thing. But nobody, no parent chastises their kid because they're trying to walk and they fall down. No, you're encouraging them to keep on going. That's what the church should be. This is what Paul saw in the church of Corinth. David steps out, I was talking about David, steps out onto the field and says, who is this giant, big mouth, whatever he is, think he is compared to the God in which I just got done worshiping? He's nothing. Why is everybody afraid of this? Because basically the devil got into their mind and the giant standing there changed their perspective wrongly. So if my perspective was changed wrongly, I can rightly change it by changing my mind. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. I was going to say something, but I'm going to let that slide. Hallelujah. Amen. Say, no, anyway, praise the Lord. Uh, um, amen. Keep on going, Kevin. Stick, stick, stick to work. Praise the Lord. <laughs> amen. I notice this in the scriptures that sometimes when the favor of God is upon us, it's for somebody else's blessing. I didn't say we didn't get anything out of it. I'm going to say this again. Most of the time, when the favor of God is on us, you know that thing we pray for? to get through that business meeting or to get that finance we need or, you know, the thing where I need your favor, God, I need these people to like me. That thing we're asking for, usually the favor is meant to bless somebody else. Yes, sir. Okay, scripture, all right, I got some. How about Joseph? Joseph gave him a vision of what was going to happen. Amen? When he shared that vision with his brothers, his brothers sold him into slavery. Then he went to prison. Amen? Because he went as a slave, served in Potiphar's household. Potiphar's wife lied about him, threw him in prison. 
in prison. He's still functioning the way God has told him to function. And he, he gave visions to, to, to the people in the prison, and, and, and they were true. And finally, he gets before Pharaoh. The next thing he knows, he's second in command of Egypt. The favor of God was upon him. But the favor of God was upon Joseph to position him where he's supposed to be so Israel would not starve. God had no covenant with Egypt. He had a covenant with Abraham's descendants. And they were starving because of a, of a drought. But God gave Joseph the foreknowledge, and of course Egypt had all the means, to gather the grain and to put up silos to where they had, a, they had an abundance of resource to save God's people. So the favor on Joseph was to save somebody else. Amen. Men? How about the woman it's mentioned in uh, John chapter 12, this woman with the alabaster box of perfume. I think John calls her Mary. Lots of Marys in the Bible, so it was the Mary version, but Mary anyway. Alabaster box. Alabaster, it's interesting, I studied this one time. Alabaster is like onyx. And the only place it comes from is Egypt. Amen? <laughs> Just so you have a background. Inside that Egyptian stone on the inside was a very expensive, very fragrant oil that she broke. In other words, you can't recollect oil that has been broken open. And she poured it over Jesus. What happened was the favor of God, as she's blessing the Lord, the favor of God came on her because both of them walked out of that room smelling the same. Both had to send that oil. Amen? Amen. It was the Queen of Sheba that told Solomon in 2 Chronicles 9 and 8 that God has blessed you with wisdom and has given you all these great things because he loves Israel. Amen? Amen. Amen. Solomon, according to the scriptures, had all this wisdom, had all this insight, had all this wealth and, and, and all, not for himself, but because God loved Israel and wasn't going to see Israel starve or, or be a, a deficiency. And, and not only the wisdom, that kings from all over the world at that time would come to Solomon and sit at Solomon's feet. Queen of Sheba got there. And sit at Solomon's feet to listen to the wisdom that he protruded out of his mouth. Though the favor was on Solomon, it wasn't for just Solomon. Amen. Solomon, you get blessed from it, but it wasn't for that. The favor that rested on Solomon was for somebody else around us. This is the focus that we forget about sometimes when we're just trying to get out of our meetings a little problem wherever we're in. I need the favor of God to get me through this meeting. I need the favor of God to get me here. I need the fa favor of God to help me establish something in this city. Amen? But the thing that we're looking for, is it for to please us or is it to work, flow through us? Like I said, the lady with the alabaster box, they came out, she came out smelling the same as Jesus. Though she blessed the Lord. What she gave to the Lord came back on her as a blessing also, as God's favor. Amen. Amen. Then we get to the term grace because basic grace, uh, I don't know how you've been taught, but I, I was brought up in religion. So I was taught wrong. I had to, un I had to unlearn everything practically. <laughs> Amen. But I was taught that grace... And I understand, I know where I get, get this from, but I was taught that grace is unmerited favor. If you've ever gone to religion, you've heard, you've heard grace is God's unmerited favor. In other words, we have grace, but it's unmerited. Now, I get the unmerited part. Nothing that we have is by merit. So I get that part. But I had a problem with Luke chapter 2 and verse 40 for it says, And the child, talking about Jesus, grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Was the grace of God unmerited favor upon Jesus? He's the only one who did merit favor. And then there's another scripture. Because the word grace absolutely means favor. That's what it means. Wherever you look it up, that's what it means. It means favor. Luke chapter 2, verse 52, same chapter down, verse 52. And Jesus increased in wisdom, stature, and favor with God and man. Now, I get the idea with God, with man. Why would, God, why would Jesus need favor or grace growing with God when he was the son of God? Some of you look at me perplexed. 
because you were taught that you were a sinner and it was God's grace that brought you to where you're at to be saved, and that's where you stopped. So you were a sinner saved by grace to go no further but to go to heaven when you die. Now, how many want the truth this morning? Amen. How is it that Jesus had to grow in grace to do what he did for the Father when he was the Son of God? He was without sin. He wasn't coming from a sin uh, standpoint. He was coming from a creative, I mean, God, God's standpoint. I mean, was, he was eternal. Amen. How was it? Because grace, as we understand it, is not unmerited favor looking back at what we used to be. Grace is looking forward at God want what he's preparing you to be. Amen. And that fits. Yes. Because even though Jesus was born in, a, in a human flesh, he was restricted in a lot of areas of doing God-like things until he reached age 33. Why age 33? Because in the customs of that day, nobody would listen to him if he was younger. Because maturity of, of any sense of wisdom happens at 33. And then he could set on, now at, at 12 years old, he could be a uh, uh, bar mitzvah, uh, uh, and he could be, uh, sit in the Catholic, or yeah, Catholic, the Jewish synagogue and listen to the priests and so on and so forth, uh, uh, in mosque, which he did. But when he reached the age and he steps in the waters of baptism in the Jordan River and he says to John, baptize me. John says, I'm not worthy to release your sandals. He knew who he was. He said, no, baptize me. The baptism was not a baptism of repentance. Jesus didn't have any sins to repent of. It wasn't the identification of death, burial, and resurrection of Christ because he hadn't gone to the cross yet. But when he was baptized, heavens opened Hallelujah. and a voice came down and said, this is my beloved son whom I'm well pleased. If this is my beloved son whom I'm well pleased, why did Jesus have to grow in grace? Because it wasn't about who Jesus was coming from or who he was. It was about what he was about to do for the Father. Praise God. And if he didn't go to the cross, we wouldn't have any grace. Right. But it's not what we used to be. It's what we are becoming. Yes. It's what God has moved us into become. And that's why he has, a, I say this all the time, he has a plan and purpose for your life. I know because there's grace on your life. How do I know there's grace on your life? You're still breathing. <laughs> How many did stupid things when you were younger? Yeah. Well, that's because God was, you got older now because God was taking care of you when you were younger and stupid. <laughs> Amen? Amen? That's it. Growing in grace. Jesus had to grow in grace. Now, if you're going to take a definition of a word in the Bible, it should see the same definition throughout the word of God. And it pretty much is in grace until we get to this part where Grow, Jesus had to grow in grace. He increased in wisdom and stature and fell in favor. The word favor, again, is the same, same word for grace in the New King James. With God and man. Hmm. Favor with God and man? Yeah. Favor with God and man. Jesus, in his humanity, had to go through all the, he felt all the things that we feel. But in that humanity, there's also, he was also a deity. Okay? Amen. Praise the Lord. Is that too much thinking? Okay, praise the Lord. <laughs> Let me wrap it up with, huh, praise the Lord. I'm, I'm going to do it. Amen. Almost done. Praise the Lord. In the book of Ephesians, I don't have time to go break it down, so I'll, I'll just give you some scriptures and you can go on. But in the book of Ephesians, as a Christian, there are actually three postures that are mentioned as a Christian. These are our three postures. How many want these three postures? Three yes. things? Okay. Come back next week. No, all right. Praise the Lord. Three postures. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you the scriptures, so just draw them down real quick. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11. And the three postures that Paul points out in Church of Ephesus that every Christian should be positioned in, okay? Sit, walk, and stand. I don't know if, you, if some of you older people, if you remember a guy years and years and years ago, this goes back to China before communism took over. So this is back in the 50s. There was a man by the name of Watchman Me. Nee. And he, was, he, had a, he has a book out. And somebody gave me this book when I first went into the ministry. 
and the copy he gave me was from 1973. This was in 1987, so this copy had been around a long time, but he talks about these three postures. Paul brings it out, and he says, the position in Christ is to sit, then our life in the world is to walk, and then our attitude towards the enemy is to stand. Amen. If we haven't done the seating, we won't have the strength for the walk, and we won't be able to stand against the devil. The posture against the enemy is to stand knowing that God has already defeated the enemy. Amen. How would you know that from your position of sitting? He goes on to say this. He said, in, well, let me go ahead and read scripture. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6. This is, this, and we are raised up together, and he made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You know, when you're sitting, it's the only position to where your legs are not, or your feet are not carrying the weight. You're sitting right now. Your feet are not doing anything, right? So you're sitting. And that posture in Christ, if we don't get that down first, we will forget who we are. But when we have to stand up, there's a time we stand up and we walk. And in that walk is our positioning in this place, in this world right here. This is our life in this world. We walk in the, we do the Christian walk, they call it. So we walk in Christianity. But when it comes to the enemy and things coming against us and problems and situations and problems, we have to learn how to stand. Amen. If we skip the first part, you will never have the strength for the third part. Amen. When I was in religion again, and I've been in a couple different religions, but I mean religion again, it was always walk and stand, walk and stand, walk and stand. It was never sitting. They knew very little about sitting in that posture with Christ, understanding that your life is called to Him. Your life is ordered to the Lord. And when we begin to serve the Lord in that lifestyle that He gives us, amen, then we begin to see success. We also have the strength to keep on walking that lifestyle and keep on walking that lifestyle. Backsliding is totally out of the, uh, out of the conversation at that point. Why? Because we seated properly with Christ. So now we can walk. And when we walk, there's going to be a devil that's trying to stop you from the purposes of God, trying to stop you from what you're doing. And that's where you stand. Amen. And Paul says it this in, in, in Ephesians chapter 6. Put on the whole armor of God so you can stand. When you've done all the stand, stand therefore with your loins girt about with truth. Not fables, not your understanding of truth, but truth. Truth, standing in the purposes of God and standing on now, because you set with him in heavenly places, you are now fit to walk the walk here that he's called us to do, and now we're able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Anybody who falls to the purposes of the devil didn't spend enough time sitting in the presence of God. Hallelujah. I got it all in there. Amen. Amen. Now you can take it home and dissect it. <laughs> well, praise the Lord. How many got something out of the word this morning? Amen. 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 I knew this was going to be a subject that I was going to have to uh, probably break up into different parts. But because it, it, God give it to me all at once doesn't mean I have to preach it all at once. Praise the Lord. But uh, going on. But how many helped this morning? Yes. Amen. Amen. Well, at least you have an understanding of where we come from. Understand something, understand this, that our understanding is below God's nature and his being. But however, if we approach our problems, because what I'm talking about this morning, if we approach our problems, we have to take in consideration our purposes with God. He's not there to be our problem solver. He's not our servant. We are his. See, he's not there to be our problem solver. Amen? Amen? But he loves me. He gave his son for me. Absolutely true. I love my son too. My firstborn, my only son. I love my son. But I wasn't going to see him be able to crawl around for the rest of his life. I was going to teach him how to walk. And that lesson came, became a little hard sometimes. Come on, come on. Oh, come on. I fell down and he cried. Ah, come on, come on. Stand back up. Come on, you do. And, and, huh? How many know what I'm talking about? 
That lesson was hard. Amen. I mean, at that age, now you think he doesn't love you. He walks everywhere. Now he's, even, he's even got a motorcycle. He just drives out all around the place. <laughs> I didn't teach him that. By the way, praise the Lord. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand to our feet. Thank you, Lord. Thank the Lord for what he's given us. Praise the Lord. Wherever you are in this sermon this morning, wherever I spoke into your life or spoke into your situation, where you're, you've got a church that will pray behind you. This is why we, we meet so, so often during the week in most of our meetings, our prayer meetings, uh, to pray for other people. Why? Because God showed me a long time ago the value of, of his people. If you're valuable enough for Jesus to go to the cross, then you're valuable enough for us to pray for you. Amen. Hands down, which takes in about everybody. Amen? But here's, here's what mature believers do. They're not moved by what they see. Mature believers are not moved by what they see. They're only moved by what they believe. And they only believe what God has showed them to believe. <laughs> I got to stop. Father, praise the Lord. Father, we thank you this morning in the name of Jesus. We give you praise. We thank you, Lord, for the grace and for the mercy you have placed on this meeting this morning in Jesus' mighty name. And I pray anybody listen to this whether by live stream or here in the sanctuary, Father God, that you've changed, in their, changed something in their heart. That Father God, they now can see the thing unfold that they need, that one element they need to get over that barrier, to get through that problem, to overcome and to conquer because you have designed us not to be losers but be winners. You have designed us not to go behind but to also go in, uh, be on the increase. In the name of Jesus, we give you praise and we thank you, Father. In the mighty name of Jesus, we claim it for our families. We claim it for our friends. We claim it for people we go to church with in the name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. This is the purpose of church is to build ourselves up so we can be positioned and sit, stand, sit, walk, and stand. Amen? Amen. But you're going to have a hard time standing if somebody have not taught you how to sit. And I say this all the time. We're two or three gathered in my name. Jesus said, my spirit is in the midst of the gather. What does that mean? That means we actually come in here, not necessarily our, our physical posture, but we come in here and we're sitting. We're listening to the word. We're sitting at the right hand of the Father. God's anointing is here breaks every yoke of bondage. This is a safe place. This is where we're, church is where we sit. Yes. When we go back out there is where we walk. Amen. And as soon as you start to walk, here comes the enemy to lie, cheat, and steal from you. That's where you need to stand. And if you fail in the other, other two parts, come back in and we'll build you back up again and we'll sit with the Father again and we'll get the faith again and we'll go do it again. Amen. And if you fall on your face, come back in and we'll sit there and we'll do it again. Peter says, well, how many times are we supposed to forgive our brethren? Seven? He says, 70 times seven. In other words, that's a phrase used that we keep on, keep on, keep on. There is, it's not 49 times, by the way. <laughs> that's a way of speaking. But this is what you do. Amen? And keep back in here, and we'll energize you again to go back out there. Because we're changing the atmosphere of this city. Yes. This city's not changing us. Yes. Amen? Amen? We're changing the atmosphere of this city, and we're changing it for, the, for, for God's purposes. Amen? Yes. Praise the Lord.